Okay, so before we turn the time over to Dr. Bradley, I wanted to introduce our sponsors for tonight's e uh, for tonight's event. Um, we'll start with uh, Defending Utah. Defending Utah is a leading local organization working to educate citizens on the principles of liberty and expose those conspiring to take away your freedom. It's time for you to become a part of a community taking action. So hopefully um, you are, if you're interested in these kinds of events, um, we hope that you will consider joining us. We'll get more into that later. Um, our aim is to follow the rule of being anxiously engaged in a good cause. So one of the ways that we hope to do that, but there's several ways, but is to educate and create an, a, a culture of education on liberty. And then also to um, claim our freedoms and help expose those that are trying to take away our freedoms. Uh, the Ezra Taft Benson Society, their objective is to promote an understanding of our civic responsibilities, the threat of secret combinations and the principles of liberty and good government in light of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. So I highly recommend you go check out that website as well. It's a lot of great resources, website, video, social media, and um, published materials that can help you in your spreading the, the culture of liberty. And finally, Freedom's Rising Sun. Uh, works to foster understanding to the end that the cause of liberty and proper government may be again restored and be raised up as a new dawn to all mankind. We seek to make these tried and true principles of liberty and proper government popular again and expose and make unpopular the fake philosophies that have subverted the eternally important principles upon which the United States was founded. So if you are familiar with Freedom's Rising Sun, there's a weekly webinar with a Q&A session with Dr. Scott Bradley over there who we're gonna hear from. He's the author of To Preserve the Nation and copies are for sale tonight over at the table over there, I'm sure you saw. Uh, working together, these three le leading liberty organizations are hoping to inspire you to take your involvement in liberty seriously and bring your activism to the next level. Um, so we invite you to check out all the resources and books and materials at the end of the evening here. Um, so, and then after Dr. Bradley is finished speaking, um, please, if you would, please remain seated. We'll have a closing prayer. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast, broadcast to homes all across the country. We ask that you, uh, if you haven't checked, check your cell phones and make sure that they're silenced. And as well, because there's a big group here and there's people at home um, watching on Zoom, um, we ask that you refrain from raising your hand, asking comments, um, interjecting, because there'll be time for that after one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Bradley. So hold your great questions and hopefully you can remember them and, and ask them after. So we, we ask that you do that. Okay, now, finally, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Scott Bradley, PhD. Dr. Bradley is founder and chairman of the Constitutional Commemoration Foundation, a nonprofit educational organization which seeks to foster increased understanding of the U.S. Constitution and encourages a return to proper government as understood in practice at the time of America's founding. He is also the author of the book and DVD CD, CD lecture series, to preserve a nation, as I mentioned. In addition, Scott hosts a talk radio shows devoted to constitutional principles and their application to current political issues. Scott has been active in the political process for more than 40 years, formerly serving as at various times as a county central committee member, a precinct chairman, county delegate, state delegate, state central committee member, it's a long list, national committee member, platform committee member, and as a national executive committee member. Scott ran twice for the United States Senate in an effort to better champion the United States Constitution and restore the principles upon which the United States was originally established. Scott and his wife, Tamara, live in Northern Utah. They are the parents of five children and 11 grandchildren. In the tradition of the American founding fathers, he seeks to secure the blessings of liberty, not only for himself, and his posterity, but also for you and your posterity. Okay, I'll turn the time over.
Yes. Okay, I'll be using two different devices to advance the slides. If they get mixed up, you guys tell me, okay? Because uh, this particular system is being used to broadcast. And so uh, we'll have to kind of keep it synced together, I think, and hope. I just one little slight correction. Um, we have 13 grandchildren and are hoping for millions more. We love grandchildren, and I'm telling you, there is the reward God gives you for not stringing your own children. <laughs> so any of you that don't have them probably don't understand that, but if you do, you know they're a wonderful blessing, and God has given us these great treasures to enjoy. Just a little quick thing about Freedom's Rising Sun. Where the blazes did that come from? And the uh, the issue really has to it harkens back to the Constitution Convention of 1787. George Washington sat and presided at that convention, and his chair had carved into the back of it a uh, sun. And Ben Franklin remarked when he was ready to sign the Constitution that he'd often wondered if it was rising or setting. And he said he was really happy to recognize it as rising because the, this sun was rising upon the nation and it truly did. It was a, an awakening. Before that time, we had been a dusty backwater kind of set of colonies that quite frankly, in 1787, the European powers were standing in the wings, rubbing their hands and licking their chops. But pretty soon the wheels were going to fall off this experiment that had happened in North America. And they anticipated that they would actually be picking up the colonies again. But when that constitution got signed, went through this arduous ratification process and it was actually implemented, the nation stood up and dusted itself off and, and stood erect and marched forward into what is now our history as the greatest, freest, strongest, most happy, most prosperous nation on earth. And as long as we have abided by those principles, we have continued along that magnificent path with, you know, all sorts of mistakes we've made along the way, the general foundation has been sound and we've strayed far from that. This title that we have for this get together today is Wilford Woodruff from the American Founders in the St. George Temple. And I'm pretty confident that most of you have come here with a preconceived notion about this. And, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands before and after where you think this is going. But I really haven't come to tickle your ears or to foster what continues to be something that I believe has um, been a great misunderstanding for a long period of time. It does diminish what happened in the St. George Temple, but I do believe that uh, there has been a misconception that ought to be corrected, and then we rejoice in what we did end up getting. We'll start off with, let's see if we're kind of synced in here. I'm not blocking too much, maybe for you guys, a little bit of the, <coughs> a little bit of the slide program here. But I, I, I'm going to look at this more as almost a, uh, an academic presentation, not simply, uh, jump up and down, wave your arm, pep rally kind of thing. And, and the reason is that we want to understand specifically what has been said and done. And it's going to take some concentrated focus to keep track of what is ultimately going to transpire here. So um, just kind of, if you, if you thought it was a, a political pep rally, we have to dispel that out. It is wonderful to come together with people that want desperately to understand truth. And it's wonderful to get together with people that love liberty. I am so pleased to be here. We have had such a difficult time being able to gather with like-minded people. I've spoken in numerous states, but the difficulty of having a facility is, is, uh, has been pretty tough sometimes. We're so grateful for the facility that we have this evening to be able to present this material to you. But at any rate, we thank everybody for being here. We're grateful for the facility and let's kind of plow forward 
and, um, and review the message. Here's what President Benson said in general conference in October of 1987. This was out of his, uh, well, he gave some magnificent talks, but, but this was our divine constitution. He said, shortly after President Spencer W. Kimball became president of the church, he assigned me to go to the vault of the St. George Temple and check the early records. As I did so, I realized the fulfillment of a dream I had had ever since learning of the visit of the founding fathers to the St. George Temple. He said, I saw with my own eyes, let's see if it's, there we go, it is, trend, it is working, the, the buttons are working. I saw with my own eyes the record of the work which was done for the founding fathers of this great nation beginning with George Washington. Think of it, the founding fathers of this nation, those great men appeared within those sacred walls and had their vicarious work done for them. Now here's something that probably virtually nobody in the church has ever seen. And these are, let's see if we can get this functioning again. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out things like here. Go ahead. Are we there? Yep. Okay. Eyes in the back of my head is all I want. It's kind of crazy. At any rate, <laughs> these are the actual records of what was written in the St. George Temple as this work was brought forth. As you can see three lines from the bottom, there's George Washington. Okay, that's just, this is the page that the, uh, the record started on. And we go on to the next page, and I'm going to point out something that hopefully will be um, <clears throat> more apparent to you as we go on. As you look and see from here on down, and look carefully at the names, which are unfortunately a little less uh, easily read than something that might have been printed out, you will find the names of the presidents from James Madison forward to Andrew Johnson. And they are treated differently here than the rest of the names previously and on the next page also. What you will see here, and, and I hopefully understand better as we go, go into this, that those names there were individuals that were baptized by Wilfred Woodruff, and, and he had asked one of the individuals that was there with him, and you'll come to know him a little bit better as we go through this. He, Wilfred Woodruff baptized him on behalf of all the presidents except for three. And we'll get into why that was, well, except for three. All the dead presidents, I guess I should say. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is that the, uh, they were treated differently for a reason. And, and I'll just kind of overhang the market a little bit. In fact, what I'm going to in a few moments is tell you the conclusions of this before we get too far into it. And you'll have to kind of, I want to tell you the conclusions so you can kind of track with it and see if the conclusions are drawn with a reasonable bit of evidence. The conclusion is that none of the presidents appeared in the St. George Temple, except for George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. And there's reason to believe, and I hope we can kind of draw the conclusion together by the end of this, that all the other presidents were likely as a result of the fact that, that they existed, they could be documented well, and it was unequivocal proof that they needed to have their work done. And that work was done along with many, 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 many others. And we'll, we'll try and get into the evidence that, that they were taken from other documentation other than those people actually appearing in the temple. And we'll see from this shortly that um, there were the, the ones for the Declaration of Independence, and the, the two that signed the Declaration of Independence that were presidents later was John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And George Washington was specifically mentioned as having appeared also, but he was not one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. There were the signers, George Washington, and about 50 other individuals, not including United States presidents. Okay, this is probably shocking to most, but I think that there's quite a bit of evidence that that, that is the case. 
So what we have is a few pages of the American founding fathers that were there. And again, if you went down the list and can read these here, you'll find that these were, were all men that signed the Declaration of Independence. The previous slide that was here broke the other presidents out as individuals. And we see that what happened with all of the American founders that appeared in the St. George Temple, Wilfred Woodruff was, was baptized for, and then he baptized on behalf of the presidents, the rest of the men that were shown, okay? So um, what's really interesting to me, uh, amazingly, is that after the American founding fathers appeared to Wilfred Woodruff in the St. George Temple to ask that their temple work be performed on their behalf, I jump forward to, this is a little bit clumsy for me anyway. Okay. I apologize for working at two materials. The Lamanite, there were Lamanite chiefs that appeared. And again, most people are not aware of this. There were Lamanite chiefs that appeared to Wilfred Gordriff in the St. George Temple to request that their temple ordinances be performed on their behalf. And it's interesting to me that there's actually more Lamanite chiefs that appeared than the American founding fathers. And I can, um, it's interesting to me as we look at these, these were the Algonquin tribes. Uh, here's an Algonquin chief, here's a Seneca chief, there's an, and I mean, if you look at each one of those names, and can you imagine coming in here and having to read? I mean, I think phonetically the record keeper had to kind of now spell that for me. And, it, and well, of course, it was, they, they did it phonetically, I'm pretty sure. But the fact of the matter is there are actually more of these Algonquin chiefs that appeared in the St. George Temple and requested that their work be done than, than literally there were American founding fathers. And it's interesting to me also the locations that these chiefs came from. They were in the northeastern United States, Lower Canada area, every single one of them. And so it's kind of an interesting scenario to me to follow up on these things and take a look and see who, what, when, and where came to appear. President George Washington, as President Benson said, was ordained a high priest at that time. You will also be interested to know that according to Wilfred Woodruff's journal, John oh Wesley, God. Benjamin Franklin, and Christopher Columbus were also ordained high priests at that time. So there were four men that were ordained high priests. These are our brethren, if you will, at that time. And by the way, Christopher Columbus and John Wesley were two of those of the other eminent men that were there for the founding of the nation that, that uh, actually appeared. You know, it's interesting to me, and I don't, I wish there were time to discuss where these men fit in the founding of the nation and these critical issues of it. Uh, perhaps some of you are aware of what Orson Hyde said in 1854 regarding um, Moroni as being the prince of the nation and how he had, since uh, the establishment of the nation, since he had been with Christopher Columbus as he came westward in his frail little wooden boats boats that we probably wouldn't go out on Bear Lake in today, but uh, these guys ventured into the great deep. And uh, he, Orson Hyde said specifically that Moroni was by the side of and encouraged uh, Christopher Columbus. And John Wesley, of course, without going into all the details of everything was a magnificent, he was the founder of the Methodist religion. And you might recall from reading Joseph Smith's history that he was inclined to go with the Methodist faith before he had his great theophany that he had with the father and the son. Now, John Wesley got an awful lot of things right. He was an ardent supporter of the savior in this land and helped to foster that religiosity that, that was so important to uh, establish this land and for us to go forward honestly. But the fact of the matter is that uh, Hyde spoke also about the uh, uh, fact that Moroni was with Washington in his camps. Moroni was leading his banners on the battlefield. And uh, against all odds, the nation prevailed. 
He also said, tragically, that uh, Moroni had abandoned the nation as we have abandoned the principles that God set forth and that he would return when we re-embrace the principles again. And that happened in 1854. So <clears throat> I would ask you, are we closer or farther away today? And that's something we've all got to consider, I think. But in regards to these individuals, uh, President Benson said, when one casts doubt about the character of these noble sons of God, I believe that he or she will have to answer to the God of heaven for it. So we hear so much in our political world today, in our uh, academic world, that uh, people, let's say, for, for example, like Christopher Columbus, he's denigrated to the nth degree. There's a slanderous rumors and propaganda and everything that are constantly cast about by him. But as President Benson said, we'll have to answer to the God of heaven for it. And so I think if we are willing to stand with the principles and not be part of the narrative of the world today, I think we'd be in better standing with our Heavenly Father in regards to these things. So in August of 17, excuse me, 1877, the American founders appeared to Wilfred Woodruff in the St. George Temple. We note the artist of that, <clears throat> and there's a few other depictions that uh, we, could, we could show at this time, but it, it conveys the idea. Now you need to understand the St. George Temple was dedicated April 6th, 1877. It was the first operational temple in this, what became the state of Utah. And the previous partially operational temple for at least the endowments of the people that were coming west was Nauvoo. And so they had really not had a temple in which to have their work done. They had had the Bowery the, uh, that was dedicated. It wasn't really a Bowery, but it was by the Bowery. It was a, uh, an endowment house that had been dedicated in 1855. And, uh, and when you hear what the, the founders say and what is spoken of in the general conference, that there had been a way to do the work for these founders, but it had not been done. So here we are, uh, uh, you know, 22 years later, 1855 to 1877, there had been no work performed for the American founding fathers. So temple was dedicated April and it was August that this manifestation occurred. So there are really an awful lot of misunderstandings about what happened. They've been promoted and they've been told often enough that we've accepted them as truth. And unfortunately, we, we need to dig a little deeper to find out exactly what, what the facts are. And it's interesting, I quote John Adams here. Uh, I went back one, how did I do that? Let's see. No. Okay, there we go. Here's what John Adams said. Now this was at the trial of the soldiers in the Boston massacre, clear back in 18, uh, 1770. He says, I will enlarge no more on the evidence, but submit it to you, gentlemen, facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. And, and this hopefully will be understood as we go forward. George Washington said, there's one straight course, and that is to seek truth and to pursue it steadily. This is before my, this statement is before my eyes constantly whenever I'm sitting at my desk. I believe we have to be seeking truth regardless of where it takes us. And then we look at what President, well, it was Elder Ezra, Ezra Taft Benson at the time said, it's not enough for us to be sincere in what we support, we must be right. So we have to do that also. And of course the savior himself said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Of course we have Patrick Henry, that great uh, patriot saying for my part, good gracious, keep me going here. There we go. Okay, for my part, I am willing to know the truth, to know the whole truth, to know the worst and to provide for it. So regardless of where the path leads us, we should be pursuing truth. And I think that's what we need to be seeking all the time. So whatever frequency, fervency, passion, emotion, we repeat a story that truth is not modified and it is either true or it's not. And so that's the effort today, tonight. Truth is truth and we seek it. We can't deny it as it becomes known. I remember a... Uh, 
a professor I had that uh, I asked him one time, what if he was doing research for a particular solution that he was looking for and he had a preconceived notion of what it would be? I said, what happens when you find data that, that directs you in another direction and actually counters and, and co contradicts the premise that you're seeking for? He says, I discard it. And I said to him, that sounds rather disingenuous. I said that, that, that if, you, if you're looking for proof and you find it in another way, that it is another direction, don't you have a responsibility to bring it forth? He says, no, it doesn't. If it doesn't support my premise, my theorem, my theory, whatever, I discard it. So we should only seek to know the truth in the matter and in all others, honestly. So here's, I told you I was gonna have my conclusions that we have, and, and they're basically, as I've kind of overhung a little bit and expressed it, the signers of the American Declaration, along with others he noted that were involved in the establishing the foundation of the United States, appeared to Wolfred Rudolph and sought to have their temple ordinances be performed on their behalf. So that we, I think we're all okay so far with that. The American presidents, with the exception of the first three, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, did not appear to Wilfred Woodruff and request their temple work be done. But their work was done based upon their eminent and well understood documented status. Their identities and lives were well known and could be verified, just like all the names we currently seek to perform temple ordinances for. So this is, this is very important. And, and I believe it ushered in a new concept very early in the time that a temple was available in the state of Utah. I write the hundreds of other names of eminent and famous people we have to come to associate with this event did not appear to Wilfred Woodruff and request their temple work be done. But their work was done based upon their eminent and well documented status, their identities and lives were well known and could be verified, just like all the names we are currently seeking to do temple ordinances for. Number four, the events associated with this temple work in St. George Temple perhaps marked a new beginning in the work for the dead. And that by his well-publicized actions, Wilfred Woodruff expanded the horizons of the saints to look beyond their kindred dead only and to begin the understanding that this is a universal work, which is as expansive of all of God's family, so all may have the ordinances made available to them in their pathway of eternal progression and fulfillment of God's great work and glory to bring to pass his, their immortality and eternal life of his children. So the point being, again, this is the first temple that had just opened in April, of 1877. I believe the saints were being taught a number of things, one of which was the, uh, the founding of this nation was a critically important thing that truly our father had a hand in. But second of all was the issue that you don't just go after grandma and grandpa and all your aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. If you can document the existence of any individual this work is important for them also. So I believe that's why all these other eminent individuals had their temple work done for them, including the presidents of the United States to that date. Even though they weren't the ones that appeared in the temple, then they still had to have their work done. So we look at secondhand knowledge, a rehash of these first person accounts from original sources. We're gonna try and go back to those original sources and, and, and look at, at what the original sources say about this and how there's been a misunderstanding because of inferences that we make with the way it's written. So I say that uh, virtually all of these appearances that to Wilford Woodruff recount the telling of his uh, information in two general conferences. One is 1877 and one is 1898. Now you remember in uh, Wilfred Woodruff died in September of 1898. So it's almost his last will and testament that he wanted in April conference to retell the story. 
So what I believe we have to do is look at the general conferences as well-documented first-person accounts of original sources. So we're going to review those two things along with some other statements, which are not generally available for examination, but have been publicized. So in September of 1877, Wilford Woodruff reported the following in General Conference. We'll quote his statement from General Conference. We have labored in the St. George Temple since January. We have done all that we could do there. Now, okay, now, the temple was dedicated in April. So they were doing preparatory work from January to April to get it ready for dedication. So he had been there putting the finishing touches, if you will, on what the temple was going to be used for. So they'd been in January, February, March, April, then now it's dedicated. And then this happened in August. And we have done all we could there and the Lord has stirred up our minds. And many things have been revealed to us concerning the dead. President Young has said to us and his very soul, if the dead could, they would speak in language loud as 10,000 thunders, calling upon the servants of God to rise up and build temples, magnify their callings and redeem their dead. This doubtless sounds strange to those present who believe not the faith and doctrine of the Latter-day Saints. But when we get to the spirit world, we would find, we'll find out that all that God has revealed is true. We will find too that everything there is reality and that God has a body, parts and passions and the erroneous ideas that exist now with regard to him will have passed away. I feel to say little else to the Latter-day Saints, wherever and whenever I have the opportunity of speaking to them that to call upon them to <clears throat> build these temples now underway to hurry them up to completion. After the dead, the dead will be after you. They will seek after you as they have af after us in St. George. They called upon us knowing that we held the keys and power to redeem them. I will say here before closing that two weeks before I left St. George, the spirits of the dead gathered around me wanting to know why we did not redeem them. Said they, you have had the use of the endowment house for a number of years, and yet nothing has ever been done for us. That endowment house, by the way, was, was um, dedicated, as I said, in 1855. So they'd had it for 22 years. The founders went on to say, we laid the foundation of the government you now enjoy, and we never apostatized from it, but we remain true to it, and we're faithful to God. And then, so that... that Quotation marks is, is what they said to, to uh, Wilford Woodruff. Then he went on to say, they were the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and they waited on me for two days and two nights. Hmm. Listen for all the times we hear about the signers being involved. I thought it very singular that notwithstanding so much work had been done, yet nothing had been done for them. The thought never entered my heart from the fact, I suppose, that heretofore our minds were reaching after more immediate friends and relatives. See, that's been the mindset the saints had had up to that time. I straightway went into the baptismal font and called upon Brother McAllister. And you're going to, if you hearken back, and I'm sure you'll remember the names of those handwritten notes, Brother McAllister was afterwards baptized for the presence of the United States. But he's saying here, I went straightway into the baptismal font and called upon Brother McAllister to baptize me for the signers of the Declaration of Independence and 50 other eminent men, making 100 in all, including John Wesley Columbus and others. By the way, not one, any time ever on his list is an American president, other than the first three, because they were the ones at the foundation of the nation. Then he went on to say, I then baptized him. So for every president of the United States, except three, and when their cause is just, someone will do the work for them. We'll talk about those guys in just a minute, why their cause may not have been considered just at the time. So I, I interject my uh, observations at times in these things to kind of, you know, draw things to your attention. The men who appeared, and again, he quotes, I mean, I'm quoting him, laid the foundation of the government. Okay, so <clears throat> did Andrew Jackson? He was a little boy. 
during the Revolutionary War. He didn't lay the foundation. And he was the seventh president. He was the last one that had skin in the game, so to speak, in that founding era. And he had been kind of an aide-de-camp little guy that went around and he actually was a prisoner of war for a little while. And that's an interesting story um, when he'd been captured by the British, but he was just a little boy. All of the presidents after that had not even been involved in anything that had to do with the founding of it. So the men who appeared laid the foundation of the government. Wilfred Rudolph specifically states, these were the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, let's go on to number three. Woodruff specifically states, I straightforward, straightway, went into the baptismal font and called upon Brother McAllister to baptize me for the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Again, I'm just reiterating what he said in the September conference meeting in 1877. And 50 other eminent men making 100 in all, including John Wesley, Columbus, and others. Number four, he went on to say, that he then baptized Brother McAllister for every president of the United States except three, and when their cause is just, somebody will do the work for them. Okay, since they're noted separately, and in a real sense, because Woodruff was not baptized on their behalf, it could be inferred that the presidents of the United States were not part of the 50 other eminent men, making 100 in all. Number five, other sources that claim to have documented the facts from Wilfred Woodruff's journal name the excluded former presidents for which their work was not done, as Martin Van Buren. I wish there were time to talk about what Joseph Smith said about Martin Van Buren. And um, he did not have high regard for Martin Van Buren. And in fact, I don't know as I've ever said anything more unkind about any political individual uh, than Joseph Smith said about him, so I don't feel so bad. Um, and he didn't curse him or anything like that. He said he was a fool and a fop. There you go. Anyway, so Martin Van Buren was the president when Joseph Smith went and asked for help in being able to have some relief from what was happening, you know, out in Missouri. Okay, Jan, James Buchanan, he sent the army. He declared war on the saints. And uh, it was an ill-conceived Utah war, and you probably remember that. We'll talk a little bit about that shortly. But Ulysses S. Grant was still living at the time, so obviously he couldn't do his work for him. And uh, so there's some references I have farther down that will talk about this. But John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were the only presidents of the United States who laid the foundation of government as signers of the Declaration of Independence. As you might recall, they were, they were members of the committee that, would, that broke off from the main body and took a period of time to write the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Thomas Jefferson ultimately became the principal author of this whole thing. And initially there was some discussion about having John Adams do it, but John Adams said, no, you better do it. First of all, nobody likes me. And, and he had a pretty good set of reasons for that. He, if, you've, if you take the time, if you haven't done this in your life, <laughs> you need to read the reconciliation letters between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. There are magnificent insights into some of the most brilliant minds of those that helped found this nation. John Adams is kind of that clipped, sharp, abrupt, prickly almost New Englander. And Thomas Jefferson is that smooth, genteel Southern gentleman. Adams could wish you a good day and you'd think he'd slapped you in the face. Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, could tell you to take a long walk on a short pier. You'd, he'd say, he wished me a good journey. You know, it's, they were just so different in their temperament. And John Adams recognized that he was not well liked for that. He was brilliant in every way. And their reconciliation letters to me, oh my goodness. They, as I said, they're wonderful insights, but, but just let me tell you a couple of things. Many believe within the church that Joseph Smith coined the term pre priestcrafts. He did not. He used a term that was in common usage in, in the founding era of America. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson used the term priestcrafts as they reconciled with each other. And they talked about how false priests had destroyed the true gospel of Jesus Christ for their own benefit. Okay. And they went on so far to say that they hoped for in the very near term 
the restoration of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, they hoped for it to be in their lifetimes, although the, because they were aging, they thought it might not happen in their lives. But they hoped for it and indeed prayed for it. And it's interesting to me, they both died July 4th, 1826. 50 years to the day they, they signed the declaration, okay? They both died. Look at the timeline. The father and the son had appeared to Joseph. Moroni had come back. He had been getting the information for all the gold plates translation stuff. And four years after their death, not quite, because the church was officially organized in April of 1830. I mean, they were on the very cusp of what they had both been seeking and hoped for. So priestcrafts and the restoration of the gospel, these men were very, very much in understanding about that. So they were both presidents that had both had a hand in the bringing forth of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, now we can look also that George Washington was mentioned in Woodruff's April 1898 General Conference Address. We're going to go over that in just a few minutes. But understand that Washington, although he was not president, president at the signing of the Declaration, he was one of those that was considered instrumental in the founding of the government. In fact, had not George Washington be th been there, it would have been probably nearly impossible for it to happen. He was the indispensable man. He was, as was said later at his, at his death, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. People implicitly and explicitly and unequivocally trusted him. And they knew that if his hand was in it, it was not a tyranny being developed. He had been offered on a number of occasions the opportunity to be president, not just president, king, if you will, of this land. When he was the only man left on the continent with a standing army, he could have said, well, this power stuff feels pretty good to wear. Maybe I'll hang on to it for a while longer. How many men, lesser men, have done that? I've got a chapter in my book about the elegant and eloquent leadership style of Washington. He would be no tyrant ever. And, and every chance he had to hold power, it was almost forced upon him. Compulsory. You will take this. You will run with it. But as soon as he had the opportunity to deflect it away, he handed it back. He could have, had he desired, taken power and become king for life, literally, and he didn't. So he was the indispensable man. And when it came time for the, the convention to happen, had he not been there, it probably would have failed. And in fact, there was a very good chance he wouldn't have been. I've read the letters between him and others like James Madison, and when he was implored to come to it, and he really didn't commit to it until the last minute. He had been appointed as a delegate from Virginia. He deflected that a number of times, said, pick somebody else. I'm not your guy. But he ended up showing up and he was unanimously elected president of the convention. And as he was unanimously elected for everything all the time, anything he ever did. But the fact of the matter is that um, he thought he was done when he got done with that. And then just as a little interesting side note, guess what day they elected him president of the United States? The Electoral College elected him president of the United States? April 6th, April 6th, 1789. That's when they elected him. Does that ring a bell with anything else? I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. And he was inaugurated on April 30th. But at any rate, he was there as an instrumental man in laying the foundation of the government. Number eight. Wilfred Woodruff makes mention by name of others who appeared who did not participate in the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but could be considered because of their foundational efforts to have been among those that laid the foundation of the government. By the way, none of those at any time was mentioned that had became a president other than those three we've already talked about. At no time in this address or the 1898 address, which we'll re, uh, review in just a few minutes, Again, last will and testament. You remember when President Benson gave his I testify? Monumental. He stood before the church and the world and 
every paragraph, and sometimes integrated in a paragraph, I testify, and he gave a specific, powerful endorsement of certain eternal truths. Well, Wilfred Woodruff did that in April and died in September. And uh, so, I mean, this was something that he considered very important. Woodruff specific, okay, at no time does Woodruff specifically state that any of the other US presidents appeared at that time and requested that their work be done. Number 10, <clears throat> from other sources that claim to have documented the facts from Wilfred Woodruff's journal, we learned that temple ordinances were not performed at that time for two signers of the declaration, as John Hancock and uh, William Floyd, because they'd been previously done. Okay, so let's go on to statements which purport to be quotations from Wilfred Woodruff's journal. And this, this information has just become available in a digital format now. So here we have August 21st, 1877. And so we know it happened in the last third of August. I, Wilfred Woodruff, went to be back to the temple of the Lord this morning and was baptized for 100 persons who were dead, including signers of the Declaration of Independence, except for John Hancock and William Floyd. Then I note the endowment and the baptize, baptism and endowment, which also occurred in May. Remember, it was dedicated in April. And these occurred just a, almost a month. Well, it was a month and a half, two months later for John Hancock, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll see in just a minute the other one that was done too. I was then baptized for the following names. I do not include those following names, but they do not include the American founders, uh, excuse me, the American presidents. Brother McAllister, and if you thought, hearken back to the handwritten notes we had at the beginning, was baptized by me for all the presidents of the United States that were not on my list. And then you know what I've got the, the ellipse in there with the three dots. And uh, then at the bottom, I've got except Buchanan, Van Buren, and Grant. In the middle, I've interjected one of my statements. So he would refer to Adams, Washington, and Jefferson were on the list because they had laid the foundation of the government and became the first presidents of the United States. So what Wilfred Woodruff goes on to say, it was a very interesting day. I felt thankful that we had the privilege and power to administer for the worthy dead, especially for the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And that inasmuch as they had laid the foundation of our government, that we could do as much for them as they had done for us. Now, I will parenthetically remark to you that I have it on good account because uh, it's been said by so many uh, prophets and apostles in our day that had our nation not been established as it was with our declaration, our constitution, our bill of rights, the United States could not have become the foundation upon which the gospel was established. And in fact, the gospel would not have been established, not just delayed. Prophets have stated specifically that those things had to happen. And it's interesting to me that between the shots that were fired in the uh, Lexington and Concord Green in 1775 in that April morning, and the actual establishment of the gospel officially in April of 1830 was, was just 55 years. Far more than, you know, I've been uh, far less time than I've been on the earth, and certainly within the lifetime of one man. And we look at the, the sequence of events that just kind of avalanched forward after we got the Declaration, the Constitution, and our Bill of Rights, and the nation had a slight period of time in which to kind of, the ground was plowed and the seeds started to take root, the idea of religious liberty and all these kinds of things, Joseph Smith was born December of, of 1805. And then in 1820, that young boy received the father and the son. And then 10 years later, the fullness of the gospel was established officially on the earth. It has been absolutely miraculous how quickly it happened once they had these things occur. So James Bleak um, gave these quotations that uh, follow, but you first need to understand he was a clerk to Brigham Young. He's mentioned in Woodruff's 1898 conference address. And this reference I have is coming out of a book that many of you have probably got in your library titled Other Eminent Men of Wilford Woodruff. 
It's on page 420. So this information came out of that book. I was also present in the St. George Temple and witnessed the appearance of the spirits of the signers, dot, 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 dot. Something was left out. The spirits of the presidents, dot, 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 dot. And also others such as Martin Luther and John Wesley, dot, 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 dot. Now these are known as ellipses and we'll talk about what the definition is there in just a minute. Okay, who came to Wilfred Woodruff and demanded that their baptism and endowments be done. Wilfred Woodruff was baptized for all of them. Again, this is out of Bleach Journal. While I and brother JTD McAllister and David H. Cannon, who are witness of the request, were endowed for them. Okay, so Wilfred Woodruff was, was baptized, and then these other brethren were endowed on their behalf. These men, dot, 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 laid the foundation of this American government and signed the Declaration of Independence and were the best spirits the God of heaven could find on the face of the earth to perform this work. Now from that, if you go back and take a look at what happened, that we're back again, you would easily infer that the, the spirits of the presidents were involved in that, would you not? Unless you understood what dot, 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 dot meant, okay? So, um, See if we're on the same side. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think we've already done that one, haven't we? Okay. Martin Luther, not to be confused with somebody else with an extra name on the back, and John Wesley helped to release the people from religious bondage. So, so Martin Luther, with his theses that he nailed to the wall, well, to the door, and I'm not sure if that's really a true story or not, because it seems a little overdramatic for a humble monk to do. But at any rate, uh, he, with his Reformation efforts to get truth restored based upon what scriptural evidence was before them, John Wesley, again, the founder of the Methodist religion, helped to release the people from religious bonding that held them during the Dark Ages. By the way, they are on the list of 100, total 100 of individuals that, that uh, Wilfred Woodruff said appeared to them. They also prepared the people's hearts so they would be ready to receive the restored gospel when the Lord sent it again to men on the earth. Okay, so I again have a few observations about this. So here's the ellipses I talked about, the three dots or the four dots. So they indicate missing information that was left out of the record that were offered. And the fact that the entire statement is not given and that conclusions or inferences may have been drawn, which may or may not have been clearly stated, had the missing information been available to read in context. Now we'll look at what Noah Webster said about this grammatical punctuation thing. One or more words are omitted, which the hearer or reader may supply. And that's what we do when, our, when the information is given to us, we infer and apply often what information is there. In our modern dictionaries, we learn that uh, these ellipses are used when they're omitting a word, a phrase, a line, a paragraph, or more from a quoted statement. The quotation notes, again, again, quoting from his journal, the appearance of the spirits of the signers. This quotation isolates the spirit of the presidents with ellipses. So the, the, the presidents, are separated from the spirits of the signers with stuff that's left out, okay? Does not specifically state that they appear to Wilfred Woodruff, and it's only given by inference. Okay, so this reference states that Wilfred Woodruff was baptized for all of them. Well, now we know he was not baptized for anybody but the founders and those others that appeared to him. The presidents were all baptized separately. In his 1877 conference address, Wilfred Woodruff stated that he called upon Brother McAllister to baptize me for the signers of the declaration and 50 other eminent men, making 100 at all. So Wilfred Woodruff was baptized for those that appeared. In the 1877 address, Brother McAllister, uh, uh, Wilfred Woodruff then states, I then baptized him or every president of the United States except three. And when their cause is just, somebody will do the work for them. Okay, so again, they set aside the presidents. 
In every complete first person original source, Wilfred Woodruff is noticed as being, noted as being baptized for the signers. He definitely states appeared to him and the American presidents are differentiated, separated, including someone else being baptized on their behalf. Number six, Bleak's journal entry, as we have it, also goes back to the declaration signers and his statement absolutely precludes the American presidents in his message because the events of the founding of the United States happened out of their time. Okay, then he goes back into quote, these men laid the foundation of this American government and signed the Declaration of Independence and were the best spirits God of heaven could find on the face of the earth to perform this work. So in every instance, the presidents are separated either by some kind of grammatical or punctuation kind of thing or just left out altogether. So we go to the end of his life in April of, of uh, uh, 1898, and Wilfred Woodruff says the following, I'm going to bear my testimony to this assembly if I never do it again in my life, which he did not because he died a few months later, that those men who laid the foundation of this American government and signed the Declaration of Independence were the best spirits the God of heaven could find on the face of the earth. They were choice spirits, not wicked men. George Washington and all the men that labored for, that, for the purpose were inspired of the Lord. Another thing I'm going to say here, because I have right to say it, every one of those men that signed the Declaration of Independence with George, General George Washington called upon me as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ in the temple of St. George two consecutive nights and demanded at my hands that I should go forth and attend to the ordinances of the house of God for them. So here we have another testimony, uh, the two separated from 1877 to 1898. Men are here, I believe, again going on with his address, that know of this, brothers J.T.T. McAllister, David H. Cannon, and James C. Bleak, brother McAllister baptized me for all these men, and then I told these brethren that it was their duty to go to the temple and labor until they had got endowments for all of them. They did it. He goes on to say, would those spirits have called upon me as an elder in Israel to perform that work if they had not been noble spirits before God? They would not. I bear this testimony because it is true. The Spirit of God bore record to myself and the brethren while we were laboring in that way. So again, some observations that I would reinforce. The men that laid the foundation of the government and signed the declaration. George Washington and all the men that labored at that purpose were inspired of the Lord. Okay, so these men are specifically mentioned again. And then every one of those men that signed the declaration with General Washington called upon me as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ in the temple two consecutive nights and demanded at my hands that I should go forth and attend to the ordinances of the house of God for them. Again, th those are the only ones mentioned. Then he says, Brother McAllister baptized him for those men. And he required that the other saving ordinances be performed. And then he says they were noble spirits of God. And no other presidents in the United States at any time and anywhere in any of these remarks are mentioned by the men that were involved. So there's some other interesting information that I think will, you will find interesting, at least. <laughs> these events again occurred in 1877. There were two books in print that I personally believe played into the work that was being done in the St. George Temple. And they were books that track in an uncanny manner with the other names for the work that was done at the time. And in fact, some of the books that have been written talk about other eminent individuals, as you might recall. So the people that are mentioned in these books, they're eminent individuals in history. They're poets, artists, writers, actors, soldiers, monarchs, leaders, statesmen, adventurers, scientists, and so on. Okay. Even the titles of the books convey the possibility that they played into this event and were possibly used as a source material for the temple ordinances. Hmm. What were these two books? By the way, they are available today. I mean, I don't have them here, so don't go try and buy them. It would cost you a substantial sum to get them because they're quite uh, expensive at this point. They're titled Portrait Gallery of Eminent Men and Women of Europe and America, Embracing History, Statesmanship, Naval and Military Life, Philosophy and Drama, the Drama, Science, Literature and Art with Biographies. That's a long title, but that is the official title. 
They came out in 1872 and 1873. And it's interesting, I included this little information. There's 119 engravings of portraits of these individuals, okay? So it's two volume set. And here's a picture of the two volumes. They're sitting side by side with the front of one of them opened up so that you can see that they actually have the title that they say. So these were current at the time that Wilfred Woodruff brought forth other names to be baptized. And if you've gone through those, well, you haven't, I'm pretty sure, but you can go look for them. You'll find that these individuals that are often promoted as having appeared to Wilfred Woodruff are found in those books and are documented as having existed. They're, they're, uh, it's, it's evidence, pretty strong evidence that they existed. They lived lives of mortality upon this land, in the, in Europe and the United States. And ultimately and finally, they uh, were documented to the point that they, you could do the work. But did these other people, could it be that they didn't appear? I, I, I have to ask that question. The question could be that Wilfred Woodruff simply copied their names from the books and told the brethren to go do the work for them. Could that be? Could it be, <coughs> excuse me, that Wilfred Woodruff was inspired to take action that would tell the saints, hey, look beyond your own kindred dead. Seek out any of all of God's children because the work's for everybody, not just for your family members. Because God was saying he wanted to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of all mankind. That was as broad of a scope, and it wasn't limited only to those that could do the work for their kindred dead. I would submit that it's all encompassing. These people were well documented. They lived. It could be proved. And they themselves needed to have the work done for them, as do all of us and all of our ancestors and everybody that's existed on the earth that's willing to accept it. So perhaps Wilford Woodruff's efforts in the temple at that time opened a new expanded chapter in temple work. Again, remember, it was dedicated in April. This happened in August, and he talked about it in September. And again, you know, in the 1898 uh, Last Testament, that he did on it. But the people needed to understand how expansive this work truly is. And, and this, you know, it, it got a lot of attention. So... Um, this next portion will probably be difficult for many to even consider. I think of my own father. He has more pictures in his bedroom of Abraham Lincoln than of me. Now, I know that's not a big deal for most people, but he seems to have a greater love for Abraham Lincoln than he does for his own son. Of course, you can see it wouldn't be very hard to have that happen, but, but so we're wondering, did he appear in the St. George Temple? Let's go back and look at some of the things about what happened, and, and you can kind of try and put this into context, if you will. My position, as you probably have already ascertained, is that he did not appear in the St. George Temple, and it may also go even farther to say that uh, the chances of him appearing were slim and none, but since he had existed, it was time to do temple work for him. I'll give you an example of someone that you may consider to be a real scoundrel. You've heard of Aaron Burr. You know, he shot Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton. You knew that. They had a duel. And Aaron Burr was vice president of the United States at the time. And uh, Alexander Hamilton and him had been competing attorneys in New York. And without going into the whole story of this thing, you need to understand there was bad blood with them for a lot of years. And in fact, in the, the uh, election that Thomas Jefferson ultimately took the presidency in, it was basically a tie vote between uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. But because of the bad blood, Alexander Hamilton used his leverage with other Federalist uh, politicians to throw their support behind Jefferson, and Jefferson became the president. And under the conditions that were at that day, the guy that came in second became the vice president. Okay, so Burr and him really had some real bad blood. Burr ended up and him, they met in New Jersey and took some shots at each other and Hamilton died, okay? Well, most of us don't do duels 
nowadays. Okay, sometimes it would be a good solution, I, I'm pretty sure, but, but I'm not sure that it would be embraced by most of society. But the fact of the matter is that one day I was at my home and the knock came at my door and it was a woman and her daughter. And they said, we have something you might be interested in. Said, What's that? They handed me one of these little blue cards. Some of you may have seen that uh, you maybe carried some through the temple. They handed it to me. I looked at it, Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr. And I looked at the dates on it. Could this be the same guy? I said, is it? And they said, yes. They said, he's one of our ancestors and his, and his temple work has not been done. I said, whoa. And he, they said, would you like to do it? And I said, sure. So they handed me the card and they took off. Well, knowing the story that I knew and this, duel that had occurred and some of the other shenanigans. I mean, if Thomas Jefferson could have had Aaron Burr hanged on any number of occasions, he would have. I mean, I'm absolutely positive. He believed he was a traitor to the cause and the country and everything. Else. It was taken to court a number of times. He was found not guilty and all this kind of, but there's still bad blood between Jefferson and Aaron Burr. And so I was a little, I mean, I, how do I feel about this? And of course, how can I be a judge, a judge of this man, really? But I still felt I knew enough that maybe I better find out for myself. And so I made it a matter of prayer for a number of weeks, literally. And I came to the conclusion that it was time and he needed to have his work done for him. Okay, so if this guy could have his work done for him, why not other people? Maybe even me. Maybe I would qualify for something someday. So anyway, that, that's just a little story to say, who are we to judge? But as we look at this, um, do any of you know the story of John Dawson? Just by show of hands, he was the uh, federal governor appointed by Abraham Lincoln. The guy was a scoundrel, wasn't he? I mean, holy cow. I mean, this guy uh, that Lincoln sent out, I, I won't go into all the details, but you'll probably get more information than you want. <laughs> He, he left, he came to the, to the assignment and, and left after three weeks. I, I have it written here. He allegedly made grossly improper proposals. They were lewd and <clears throat> crude to a Mormon widow named Albina Merrill Williams. She, when the proposals were made to her, took a, you know, one of these little shovels that you used for fire stoves and stuff, beat the snot out of it. Okay, and he was so thrashed about that he basically jumped an eastbound mail coach and he headed out of town, got out of Dodge, if you will. This, he was leaving Salt Lake though. But when he got up to the Mountain Dell area, some of you may have been to Mountain Dell, he got to the Pony Express station there and he kind of thought he was safe. But there had been a group of young Mormon vigilantes, I call them. And as you'll find out, they they said they were under direct orders from the police chief in Salt Lake City. But anyway, they had followed him. They attacked him and beat him and they <clears throat> partially finished the job but did not quite get it done, okay? The assailants then claimed later that they were acting under the orders of the Salt Lake police chief but four of them were captured and the other three were gunned down trying to escape. So it wasn't really a happy ending for some guys that wanted to do a good job. But at any rate, that's what Lincoln appointed to govern Utah. He did not have any great love. And as the more we get into this, you're gonna find that there was really some bad blood between him and the leadership. So it's not hard to understand that there was bad blood. Uh, many of the leaders of the nation really held the Latter-day Saints in great disdain. And let's look, for example, of James Buchanan, the guy that whose immediate predecessor of Lincoln, he declared war on the saints. He sent the army to Utah to defeat this little ragtag religious organization. As they came westward, the soldiers had been promised that they could have all the Mormon women they wanted once they captured this vagabond religious sect. So these are great, I don't know, uh, noble people that were coming out here to take care of us. 
Okay, well, not you and I weren't there, but some of our ancestors were. So, and I've got a few minutes. I'm going to take a minute or two here on this. There are many that, and I'll just share what I believe. It's my philosophy about the origins and causes of the Civil War. And most people are taught unerringly and unequivocally and completely and devotedly that this cause was slavery. And a guy by the name of George Mason in the, the Constitution Convention of 1787, who would have been considered if the vernacular had been, you know, in vogue in those days, an abolitionist. He and guys like Ben Franklin were very ardently against slavery. And he made a comment that if, you know, nations can't exist in the eternities. So by nature of that fact, they have to be chastened in this life if they are to be. And you might say, well, what does that do for us today? It, it's, there could be a very bumpy road ahead. But the nation can only be punished or rewarded in mortality. And, and so, you know, it, it behooved nations to not participate in things that were not noble, good, uplifting. And, and if, if we look at the United States, well, let's look back at what I said earlier about Moroni and, and how he had been involved in the establishment of the nation and the bringing forth of all the magnificent principles so the gospel could be established and it could be this great, free, strong, happy, prosperous and respected nation. But yet he had withdrawn from the nation because we had abandoned those principles. So you have to say, what would cause that to happen? Now, in my opinion, and I think I can scripturally demonstrate the likelihood of this, was that they had killed the prophets, Joseph and Hiram. They had driven the saints from their presence. They had driven them out of the land. And if you think about Ammonihah in the 16th chapter of Alma and so much like that, and what happened to those folks, you say, yeah, that's a kind of a similar parallel. But what about this? wicked, and I call it wicked, Mexican War that happened in 1846, 47, both, both years, and it ended early in 48, uh, 47. At any rate, 48, no, that's when it, early, when it ended. Treaty, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. At any rate, there were negotiations going on, and without going into great detail, uh, the Mexican government was inclined to agree for the purchase price of the area that was in question, exchange of gold for the land. But they were reluctant because they felt that because of how often Mexican revolutions occur, they couldn't be sure that the next government would be as, as willing as they were to abide by the principles. And so they were reluctant to sign on to that. There was a disagreement along where the boundary, this was when Texas was being invited into the union. And because the way they had ended the war in 1836, the boundary lines between the two countries were not well defined. They just all kind of went home and everybody went back to their business. So there were war drums that were beaten and, and pretty soon the war hawks basically prevailed and all deaths considered from you know, civilians and, and uh, military and so on, about 22,000 Mexicans died and about 18,000 Americans died. So 40,000 people, were killed for something that could have been resolved with probably six more weeks of diplomacy. And so that was an unrighteous thing. The US government had a, if not openly stated, but uh, sought for effort of genocide upon the children of Lehi that were left in this land. And if you think that's crazy, go look at the stacks and mounds and of skulls and, and bones and hides of their food supply, which was wiped out in order to destroy their food storage and their, their, their uh, ability to feed their wives and their children. I mean, there was, there was economic issues. There was slavery, yes, certainly. But they had declared, this country had declared war on God's saints and had sent an army with nefarious purposes to try and capture and destroy the saints. All of this, I think, added and to the statement of George Mason that, you know, as a nation, we are chastened in this life. And I think the Civil War was one of those kinds of things. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this thing, but this will be rather shocking, perhaps, to you. Occult practices in the Lincoln White House? Are you kidding me? 
Now, they did have seances, and Lincoln participated in them on a number of occasions that we know of. Some people say, oh, he was just being a regular guy, and that's what they were doing. His wife was very definitely heavily involved. In fact, later on in life, uh, one of her sons had to intervene with the uh, uh, practice that she had of, of uh, diminishing the, the family fortunes in payment to uh, spiritualists, okay? So these kinds of things were happening in the Lincoln White House with the occult practices. And then, uh, by the way, this is, was fairly widely reported then, but in more recent years, there's more evidence that's come forth. And then there's inferences of sexual proclivities that Lincoln had in his life. It's like, what? What are you talking about? And it's like, you, it, it's, it's not well hidden if you, if, unless you're willing to bury your head in the sand. Uh, these were written in the diaries and the correspondence of the era. And they're so, contra if you think about the statements that are made by modern revisionist historians about the uh, uh, licentiousness of Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin, there's not one scintilla, not one shred of evidence from the written word of the day when they were alive, that this actually happened. Nobody wrote in her journal, I conquered the great Franklin. Franklin, by the way, was the most widely known American of the year, of the, you know, the whole era, because he was the face of America overseas. Nobody ever said in a letter to a friend, one way or the other. There was a yellow rag journalist named James Collender that in Virginia openly wrote about his belief that uh, Thomas Jefferson had fathered a child with one of his slaves named Sally Hemming. You probably all heard this story. You probably even heard back during the, uh, the uh, Clinton years as justification, I think, for what Clinton was involved with that in turn. Um, the, oh yeah, powerful man have always done this kind of thing in the presidency, blah, blah, blah. But it was in Nature Magazine, which is normally a pretty, shall we say, credible scientific journal. And it's, it blatantly stated, DNA proof, Jefferson fathered children with Sally Hemming. Come to find out when it was thoroughly investigated, and I've written expansively about this, that no, in fact, the DNA said absolutely, unequivocally, without any doubt, and the reason that we can know this is that uh, the Jefferson family line, you know, men have an X and a Y chromosome, women have an XX chromosome. So on the Y chromosome, there's a Jefferson family anomaly that passes from father to son. Jefferson did not have any male children that we know of, so they took samples from other descendants of other male Jefferson uh, family members. And what they found that unequivocally, totally without any doubt, this child that Collender wrote about as running around Monticello and looking like Thomas Jefferson and all that kind of stuff, unequivocally was not his child. There were other children that had a, a Jefferson father. And the uh, tradition of the day, the oral history of the day, the practices that are documented, there was another Jefferson male relative that fraternized with the slaves, particularly during celebrations and so on. He liked to go to their dances and everything like that, was the father of these other children. And when these other children were fathered, the, uh, Jefferson was a sitting president and his daughter was in the, uh, the Capitol with him at the time. And, and she, there was, no, there was no inference whatsoever that he was involved with anybody such as Sally Hemming. At any rate, uh, there's no documentation and, and DNA proof actually that the individual that Collender suggested was Jefferson's child is not. So there's stuff though about Lincoln. There's diaries, there's correspondence that occurred that were contemporary to him. And, and they have been dug up and they've been expanded on in more recent years. Now, those of you that may have read the six volume series by Carl Sandburg, and, and he was absolutely unequivocally devoted to Lincoln as a great man. You got two volumes that were published in 1926 about the prairie years, and then four volumes about the war years. Okay, so even Sandburg 
wrote of Lincoln's four-year close association with a guy by the name of Joshua Steed. During the prairie years, these men in Illinois shared a bed for four years. And you say, well, a lot of times guys had to sleep in the same bed when they were sleeping, but four years for that extended period of time. And uh, you have to say, wow, that's, that's kind of weird. But their correspondence expresses a lifelong closeness. And in fact, Sandberg wrote of this relationship, and this is a quotation out of his uh, uh, 1926 volumes. A streak of lavender and spots, soft as May violets. Oh, that's kind of poetic, I guess. But anyway, that's what Sandberg wrote, okay? Now maybe he came into this subject as far as he could in the 1920s. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything more to what he said. But Speed, Lincoln's buddy, wrote of the relationship as follows. No two men were ever more intimate. Now maybe they had a little different eloquence in their day. I don't know. But that's what he wrote of them. And in fact, it's interesting that neither would have married if Speed had not married. And Speed never did have any children. Lincoln did. But uh, with Speed's marriage, Lincoln went on to get married. Okay, but they both wrote that if the other one didn't get married, they weren't going to do this. So I have to say with these teasing comments, I'll leave you with things about occult and other salacious proclivities that you can do your own personal investigations on if you're so inclined to do. But, but these things with Lincoln are kind of concerning, I would say. Now, going on to another subject. Much has been said regarding Lincoln checking out the Book of Mormon while he was president. Okay, and it is a fact. He did, in fact, check the Book of Mormon out, out of the Library of Congress. Okay, now here's a list of the books that he checked out while he was in, in his presidency. They're kind of hard to read. I'll give you the pertinent books in just a minute I've broken out. But you can uh, look on there and see many of the different subject matters that were checked out during the time he was president from the Library of Congress. So here's uh, the pertinent books that he checked out from the Library of Congress. He checked out The Mormons or Latter-day Saints in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake by Captain John W. Gunnison. He checked out Mormonism, its leaders and designs, portraits and views by John Hyde. He checked out the Book of Mormon, whom it noted in the Library of Congress was translated by Joseph Smith. He checked out Mormonism in All Ages by Turner. And again, he checked out the book, Mormons or Latter-day Saints in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake by Captain Gunnison. So those are the books that he checked out pertaining to the faith. Let's just talk about some of the individuals with this. Captain John Williams Gunnison, uh, as you'll see, was a military officer and explorer. And if you look at the what he was involved in, in 1849, he was part of the Stansbury expedition to survey the Great Salt Lake Valley. That winter was difficult to get out of town because of the heaviness of the winter, so he stayed in the valley. He took the opportunity to study the church. And when he got back to Washington, he wrote the book, The Mormons or Latter-day Saints in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake, History of Their Rise and Progress, Peculiar Doctrines, Present Condition. He came back to the valley in 1853 and into all of Utah to do some more exploration. In October of 1853, uh, him and 11 of his men in his party were killed by a band of Native Americans. Gunnison and seven of his men were killed. And I kind of euphemistically note here, the massacre added additional strain to the relationship between Governor Brigham Young of the Utah Territory and the federal government. There was a strong abiding and seemingly insatiable desire to pin this on the Mormons. And uh, Gunnison's wife, his widow then at that time, spent a lot of time agitating that the Mormons be punished for his death. Now, I don't believe that they had anything to do with it. I, I really, truly don't. But there was this feeling that the saints did not want the U.S. military out there fiddling around in, in their territory. So these, this event contributed to what became the Utah War with Buchanan sending the army out here to stop a reported Mormon insurrection. So it was kind of 
shall we say, an agitation that caused problems. Let's look at John Hyde in his book for a minute. He was probably one of, maybe, maybe the most famous apostate writer of the early American period. He joined the church in England. He went on a short mission over in Europe. He came to Utah, called on a mission to, the, to Hawaii in 1856 and set out. On the way, he renounced his religion and sent to work against the church in the islands and in California. He was excommunicated in 1870, I mean, 1857. And he was the author of the anti-Mormon anti book. This is one that Lincoln checked out. It was virulently, virulently opposed to the church. Mormonism, its leaders and designs, portraits and views. Okay, the next guy that we have is Jonathan Baldwin Taylor. J.B., excuse me, Turner. J.B. Turner. His book is Mormonism in All Ages or the Rise, Progress, and Causes of Mormonism with the biography of its author and founder, Joseph Smith, dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> they had long titles in those days. When you read a title, you knew what book you were getting. You could judge a book by its title, okay? This was a contemporary book, very unequivocally anti-Mormon, written in the period of the Nauvoo time with Joseph Smith still alive. Okay, so... It was intended to expose and debunk Mormonism, and it exposed the church in an absolutely very, very negative light. This guy was a professor, by the way. This is an excerpt I took from the introduction. <clears throat> you know, sometimes people write about the author and what they're writing about. So in this introduction, it's talking about Turner, the author of the book. He, Turner has aimed to place the Bible and the Book of Mormon in their true relative positions, and to show that the distance which separates them is infinite. The one proceeding from the light of heaven, the other from the chaos and darkness of the pit. He has no personal, meaning again, Turner, <coughs> has no personal ill will towards any of the Mormons. Be neighbors and fellow citizens, he would desire in all his social intercourse with them to treat them with kindness and respect but to treat their opinions or their books in a similar manner is beyond the reach of his capacity. Nor does he believe that the public good either requires or admits it. Is a quotation from him. Soft answers may turn away wrath, but they cannot secure, that they cannot cure fan, fanatics. The faith of the Mormons and the practices by which it has been propagated are of a class which to be hated needs but to be seen in their true light. They require, therefore, to be exposed. Their prophet complains, and this would be speaking of Joseph Smith, that others have called him an imposter and a knave. It will be for him, self, and others to judge whether this book does not prove him such. So this guy was a university professor in, in, in Illinois that wrote this book. A decidedly, unequivocally, and totally uh, a book against the faith. Now, you might say, well, he read the Book of Mormon too, and he read these anti-Mormon literatures, and, and by the way, the Gunnison book was, was more of an history appearance, historical appearance, that was more of a review, and I would think in a much more balanced light. But two of the books were absolutely unequivocally attempting to overthrow the religion. So we have a spectrum of books that are read, including the Book of Mormon. and. Uh, to, con to conclude that that was solely and only to convert himself to the gospel, I think would be a bit of a stretch. He may have been trying to look at his enemies or those that he might find that he needed a better understanding for, or perhaps he was interested in the faith from an honorable and an honest perspective. But nonetheless, to say that he checked the book out is absolute evidence that he was in favor of the faith would be something of a stretch, particularly when we see that much of what he, he read was virulently anti-Mormon. Okay, so let's look and see what Brigham Young had to say about Abraham Lincoln, which is kind of, okay, I think we're on the same slide together still. 
Quoting, now, most of these quotations are taken, taken out of uh, the journal of President Brigham Young, and sometimes there's references to people he was talking to. I don't put the whole context in there with the people, but you get the gist of what was captured in the meetings. He said, Abe Lincoln was no friend of Christ, particularly had never raised his voice in our favor when he was aware that we were being persecuted. He was acquainted with Joseph and Hiram and had been a master Freemason. Now, by the way, Many today assume that Masons are all really wicked people. This is done in a context of he should have been Joseph's friend because Joseph and Brigham and many others at the time were master Freemasons. And it's interesting to me that to paint all of the Masons with one wide tar brush is, an, is a situation that should not be done. There are good Mormons and bad Mormons, good Catholics, bad Catholics, good Jews, bad Jews, whatever. And the Masons fall in that same category. And those Masons that were involved with the establishment of the Illuminati in 1776 were kind of stepping over, not kind of, dramatically stepping over the line. And their perspective has been carried forth to the detriment of all humankind in this day. And, and we could talk at great length about some of the things that they brought forth, including their secret oaths. And there were blood oaths, literally, that I have had those in my own hands, the things that they took. So yes, there were bad Masons, but the, there's a, a similarity, a parallelism between Masons and the church, as you might well know. And some people say, oh, Joseph stole the, the temple ceremony from the Masons. Well, the origin of the Masons was clear back in the Solomon Temple. And they had things that were parallel and similar to what we have in our temple today. And so, yeah, if there's similarities, they're easily explained. It's kind of like some people to say, oh, you... <laughs> United States just copied the Algonquin tribe's uh, method of government. Well, no, they didn't. The Algonquin tribes had, were the descendants of those that had had a constitutional republic that was established under Mosiah, and they had an understanding of those principles, and the parallelisms to the United States constitutional republic are, are readily apparent. But what was the source of them? God was the source of both of them. So anyway, um, this, this concept that people today might think, oh yeah, this Master Mason thing would, would mean, yeah, Lincoln was bad. But in that case, so, was, so were Joseph and Hiram and so was Brigham. Uh, not all Masons are bad by any means. So don't, don't paint them with all the same brush. It's interesting that the Masonic order has been throughout the history of the United States, a kind of a traditional thing with a lot of military officers. We won't go into that at this time. But he went on in this other statement here, old Abe, the president of the United States has in his mind to pitch in to us when he had got through with the South. And he, he says something about Heber Shea Kimball. And, and he said, just says, President Kimball, not the one that you might know. Okay, I'm running low on batteries because I didn't get it plugged in. We're almost done here. Uh, that whether uh, that men that he had have met with, whether they had little or much of the spirit of God, were in favor of the South. Isn't that interesting? That's an interesting perspective. In 1861, this is noted, the feelings of the brethren are gratified by hearing of the continued success which attends the Southern Confederacy. I'm not sure they wanted the union to break up, but they didn't want some of the scoundrels that were pushing the other side to be in charge. Another Brigham Young, we need not expect anything sensible from them for the spirit of wisdom is taken away from them. And then he talked about President Lincoln and Congress appear not to realize that there is a war on hand. It is not so with the South, they are keen and alive. This statement by Daniel Wells, Stephen A. Douglas was a far better man than President Abe Lincoln for he knew his feelings were hostile to this people. President Wells acquiesced in his remarks, so Brigham and him had been talking about. <clears throat> Another statement, if the kingdom of God was not in the way, Abraham was a pretty good man, but he acted as if he would rather the kingdom of God was out of the way. He was not the man to raise his voice in favor of Joseph Smith when his enemies were persecuting him. He with many others had assented, so concurred, but supported the deaths of innocent men. And through that, he was subject to the influence of a wicked spirit. <coughs> this is 
uh, a little more emphatic. I will see them in hell before I raise an army for them. Abe Lincoln has set these men here to prepare the way for an army. An order has been sent to California to raise an army to come to Utah. By the way, I think that was Patrick Connor that ended up coming. In 1862, he established an army base to overlook the Salt Lake Valley up on the hill called Fort Douglas. Okay. And he was the one involved with the massacre of a peaceful tribe of Shoshones that were on the banks of the Bear River up by up in Franklin County. And we, that's interesting what a bloodthirsty group they were. Okay, this is the reason why Baal came back. I pray daily that the Lord will take away the reins of government from the wicked rulers and put in the hands of, of the wise and good. I will see the day when those wicked rulers are wiped out. Oh, thank you. I should have been drinking all along, right? I don't mean that the way you've taken it. <laughs> Some of you may remember Jackie Gleason. He was a comedian, and every time he came on stage, they brought him out a cup, and he would drink it. Mm. It was Irish coffee. They had a little lacing in it that they, he found to be comforting, I guess. But water helps my dry throat. Anyway, the governor quoted my saying about the Constitution. I do and always have supported the Constitution, but I am not in league with such cursed scoundrels as Abe Lincoln and his minions, they have sought our destruction from the beginning, and Abe Lincoln has ordered an army to this territory from California, and that order passed over on these wires. So we, we have uh, examples of why they were so mad about Abe Lincoln. Okay, Brigham Young discussed with him, this is another conversation he had in his office, the wicked course the American nation had taken with his people, observing the government was running into a despotism, and they were willing the government should be despotic while they were in power. The president observed, meaning uh, Young, that Abe Lincoln was a sagacious man, like he had wisdom and, and understanding, but believed he was wicked. Okay, so this speculation about those that didn't probably appear, in my opinion, in the St. George Temple, and should in no way detract from the thrill of the actual facts in the matter. We have powerful eyewitness testimony that the founders of this great nation truly appeared in vision and reached out to the hand of the priesthood to obtain the sacred ordinances necessary for them to obtain eternal life and exaltation. These great and noble men truly are united with us in an inextricably interwoven cause of liberty and eternity. They truly are our brothers in this great cause that faces us today. If I run out of batteries, I'll have to tell you some of the story here in a second. But you need to recall the encouraging words of President Ezra Taft Benson. Here's what he said. I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. It will be saved by the righteous citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church, among others, men and women who understand and abide the principles of the Constitution. I reverence the Constitution of the United States as a sacred document. To me, its words are akin to the revelations of God, for God has placed his stamp of approval upon it. I testify that the God of heaven sent some of his choicest spirits to lay the foundation of this government, and he has now sent other choice spirits to help preserve it. We, the blessed beneficiaries of the Constitution, face difficult days in America, a land which is choice above all other lands. May God give us the faith and the courage exhibited by those patriots who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. May we be equally as valiant and free, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now there's a, a couple of, I mean, We've got some things that you can go look at to, at the back table back here. That's things that we've got out here. Here's who has sponsored this. But let me just spend just a moment or two on something that happened in 1849. And, and uh, this is not a scurrilous off the wall thing that you can't go look up, although it's incompletely reported. In conference in, in 2008, uh, Boyd K. Packer talked briefly about this subject. 
It was the occurrence that happened on the, in July of, of 1849. The saints gathered to celebrate that finally they were in their own land. They were away from all of this, the terrible despotism that had plagued them. They had been driven from pillar to post all across the nation, been driven out of the nation by a nation that sought to, well, they did murder their prophets and dri had driven them out and great suffering had occurred. And in that celebration, they, they had a gigantic flagpole with a huge American flag uh, hung on it that they created. They had a big um, parade. And in that parade, they had some young men and young women that went forward. First of all, in that parade came the United States Constitution and the Declaration. After that came the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And then the brethren that were, that were uh, leading the church. And during that time, and without taking a whole bunch of time to discuss it, those great and noble pioneers of these valleys had a commemoration of the cause of liberty. And they pledged not only their lives, their fortunes and their honor, but the future lives, fortunes and honor of their children and grandchildren. They said that the saints would always stand with these principles. They said that the saints would, un, would uphold these principles when others had abandoned them. And they had a magnificent talk. Uh, they had some guys they called them the silver grays. These were men that had been born on or before the birth of the nation. So they called them silver grays because of their age. But these men had seen the greatness of the nation in the day before they abandoned the principles. And, and the saints had literally had those principles not only abandoned, but abused when they were driven from the land. And it's interesting to me that they literally took, if you will, a blood oath that they would uphold the principles to their deaths and that they would not ever bow before tyranny. And, and if you, uh, sometime maybe I'll have to share with you if you're interested, the actual speeches that were given. And uh, it was liberty or death, literally, what they were promote, promoting. And Brigham Young always was, uh, he supported the constitution, but as he said, he hated the damned rascals that administered it. Again, that was, I haven't used anything any stronger than that. But the point of the matter is that the saints, regardless of what had happened to them, remained true to the principles this nation was founded on. They had stood with them when Joseph Smith ran for president in 1844. And I personally believe he would have been president had he not been assassinated in June of 1844. And we could tell you the letters that I've got in my files that were written uh, from the 12. He had the most organized national uh, approach to the election. He had called political missionaries, the 12 had followed the political missionaries around that had plowed the ground and had literally prepared the way. He had written, it's in volume six of the church history that you can read about his platform. And, and in it, he offers magnificent solutions to these vexing problems like the slavery issue, to the issue of the money system. He offers advice and counsel to the states about how they ought to handle crime. And it's far different, far different the most people today would say that it should be. But the people that reviewed his principles said they were the closest to the principles of Washington and Jefferson that had been brought forth since Washington and Jefferson had been taken from the nation. It was magnificent. And people in high places were supporting George, uh, excuse me, uh, Joseph Smith. And, and so the likelihood of being elected, I'm pretty confident would have happened. And the saints had that ripped out from underneath them. They had their prophets killed. They were driven from the land. They came out here into a, a, just a harsh desert to, to make their living, but they remained true and faithful to the cause of liberty and the principles that had been brought forth under the hand of God. And truly Brigham Young said that the constitution was dictated to those men who sat in their constitution convention in 1787. That convention was held under the the power of the spirit. And he says, although unknown to them, he dictated it to their hearts. So here we are, the descendants of those pioneers that had made such a powerful commitment to the words of prophets that have talked about this down through the ages. 
And here we are at a time, it's our time. And as <clears throat> was stated, let's go back a few slides here and I'll see if I can find these again real quickly. Okay. The constitution is a sacred document. It's as though revelations from God because God has placed a stamp of approval. God sent some of his choicest spirits to lay the foundation. And he's now sent other choice spirits to help preserve it. I would feel that there are those in this room that have that charge from God. All of us were ordained in the premortal existence to certain challenges and circumstances and opportunities. And it behooves us all to discover what those are. It's interesting to me that if you have that patriotic gene, if you will, it's probably pretty deep in your heart. And your desire for these things runs very strongly, perhaps in you and in your family too. And, and we need not fight against those things. I don't know how familiar you are with the writings of W.W. W. Phelps. And he wrote in, on December 25th, 1844 in, the, in Nauvoo in the Times and Seasons, some information that he'd obtained from Joseph Smith. And by the way, Bruce R. McConkie confirms his belief that this is fact. He talks about the premortal council in which we all were present. And he tells us when that happened, according to the records that were kept and, and handed down and Joseph Smith brought this to the brethren. And Bruce R. McConkie says some of the things that the brethren learned were never taught to the general membership, but he talks about this in, in his, one of his Messiah books. He says that the premortal council happened 2,555,000,000 years ago. So in that long, long time ago, we were there present. I believe each one of us were companions in that great event. And I believe that each one of us had responsibilities that we took upon ourselves, covenants we made and we came forward with. Perhaps, perhaps this cause of liberty and the preservation of the things that allow the gospel to be carried forth to the nations of the world was part of your charge. Every year for many years, President Hinckley and I corresponded and uh, it was for an event that our family put on and, and uh, uh, the gist, gist of the conversation and the correspondence was, if this nation is to continue to be the nation from which the blessings of the gospel and eternal principles are taken forth to the world, we need to preserve the blessings of the constitution and preserve it. And President Hinckley agreed every year, and every year he sent either a member of the First Presidency, a member of the Twelve. We got a couple of seventies, a couple of different years, to come and speak to us. But he was fully in concurrence with the way that was basically considered. We need to remain strong, free, and capable of taking this message of salvation to the to the rest of the world. So I would think that the fact that he sent or they were allowed to come. I don't know if they begged him and he sent them, but they were allowed to come to have their work done just days, literally, after the first temple in this state was dedicated and prepared for the work for the dead. If these founding men were there and are our brethren and have been ordained as such and are carrying forth and, and those, those men that were made high priests, you know that the high priest responsibility is a leadership responsibility. I believe that uh, that's an endorsement of what this is. And President Benson was extremely excited about that. So as he ends here, we, the blessed beneficiaries of the Constitution, face difficult days in America, a land which is choice above all other lands. May God give us the faith and the courage exhibited by those patriots who pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. May we be equally as valiant and as free, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, and so pray I. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. I, I think it's safe to say that um, not only are we a, a few IQ points smarter, for sure I am, but um, I know that uh, it's deeply inspiring to be um, privy and here to listen to someone that has such a deep and wide knowledge of important things, especially in this day and age. Um, last year, I joined Defending Utah. And one of the first things I quickly learned 
was that as we gain a, a deeper faithful understanding of history, it opens our view and expands our minds to what can be and what should be and what's, what's wrong as well. And we have so much to learn um, from amazing men and women who have uh, experienced great things. We have huge shoes to fill. Um, Micah is now coming around to uh, offer applications. If you like what we were doing here, um, please consider uh, joining Defending Utah. There's different kinds of members um, that we that are involved, uh, supporting members, activist members. Um, please take a look at that. And um, we need your help. We need more people who get it, um, that can change the culture and that can um, really fill the shoes, fill the, um, the need and the calling that I, that I know many of you feel. I, I felt it and um, there's a lot we can do. And I, and I think the more that we meet together and talk about the ideas that we have, we, we will see that there's much to hope for and, and a lot we can do together. So again, can we uh, give another round of applause to Dr. Bradley for his 